episode of the Idea Factory podcast and now videocast. And I'm very excited to have Stan Slap here as our guest. Stan, welcome. Thanks. Good to be here. So we, we're inviting all kinds of uh, innovators and uh, big thinkers, uh, of which you certainly are one, um, and we're doing these topic areas, uh, and a lot of them are driven by the articles I'm writing, and you were the perfect person to go to for this particular topic. So, um, you know, I know you do a lot of consulting to major companies about, um, you know, culture and, and branding and positioning. And, uh, you know, today I want to talk a little bit about the inner part of that, which is the corporate culture component. Um, you know, I, I was an innovation guy for a long time, uh, implemented innovation programs of Fortune 500 companies, um, and uh, that is an experience. You're dragging a lot of, uh, you know, in some cases, uh, great people come along with you for the ride, but there's also a lot of bodies you have to drag with you. I don't know if you've observed the same thing. Well, I have with companies that don't understand how a culture works and how to work it, uh, which is most companies. Yeah, you're basically going to drag probably the entire employee and manager populations with you. I, yeah. Well, and also I think a lot of companies, even if they're great at what they do, they're not really built for change. They're built to run an engine that exists. So if you are brought in to do change or do things that are new to the business, uh, that's where you start running into friction and you're kind of treated as an antibody to the organization and they try to fight you off like a virus. Well, and that's true. And, and also most companies really don't have an appetite for innovation. It, if, if they say they want everything to be new, it means we want everything to be new as long as nothing has to change. <laughs> and, That's right. And whatever, and managers, you eat from a magic plate because it doesn't matter how much you swallow, nothing will ever disappear. And so whatever <laughs> we're asking you to do, nothing is coming off your plate to make room for that. That's and right. Th these companies that, are, that, that are, are the most obsessed with performance and competency that hold down the highest regard rarely slow down long enough for either to develop. Yeah, you know, I've noticed, uh, you know, when we went through this uh, uh, technology resource allocation process, which <laughs> just the com painful. I know just the combination of those words makes me want to cry. But doesn't it seem like somebody <laughs> should be snapping a glove before they do that with you? <laughs> You know, uh, as excruciating as it is to say, it was more excruciating to do. Oof. And, you know, and that's where, you know, all the groups throw all their projects into a pool and everyone ranks theirs as top priority. So now, you know, that some poor bastard in, right. in technology has got to sift through it and find out the truth. Is this a top priority? Why haven't we still, why haven't we done this in the last 10 years that it's been a top priority? I and um, what's that? I was just saying, many, many, many years ago, uh, Polaroid asked us to come in and work with them on some strategic projects. This is 20 years ago. And the caution from one of their senior people before we went in is, don't let your project get polarized. I said, what does that mean? They said, well, that's our term for when, when in strategic initiatives don't work, we have a committee that investigates why they don't work. That committee then forwards their recommendations to another committee who looks at that. And then there's the senior committee that examines all the recommendations from all. I'm not, my brain is not big enough to make this up. This is like, so they said, just don't get in that loop and you should be fine. I said, so change nothing. They said, great. <laughs> How well, you know, doing now? How are they doing now, Fall right. right. This is the amazing thing. I would guess that there's at least at any given time 40 to 60 percent of people at a corporation that would have trouble explaining what their jobs are uh, or, or certainly connecting what their job description is to what the company does and how it makes money. And the um, other 40 percent probably don't care. So. <laughs> That's probably true too. Um, so, you know, I, what I want to focus on today is more the psychology 
psychology of the people inside the company. So I, I kind of, through my travels, you know, I was a, a consultant at Anderson for a long time before I went into corporate. Uh, and, you know, so I've seen companies both from the outside in and then from the inside out. Uh, and, you know, I've observed certain things and certain characteristics of the people inside the companies. And I'm just curious to see if you've uh, observed the same things and then what your thoughts are on how to motivate uh, these different types of people and what messages get through or don't get through to the different types. So let me kind of give my hypothesis and you, you can uh, give me your thoughts. So, you know, when everyone starts out, I, I call them patsies because they really don't know anything. They're tabla rasa, blank slate. And uh, they come in with, you know, youthful optimism and, you know, eager to learn and do almost anything. And I've sat in very inane meetings with them because they're, you know, they'll give you this whole, you know, why, you know, uh, the thing that comes to mind, why diversity is so important. And then they'll go through this thing where everyone needs to be diverse and it's great for the co corporation. Everyone thinks differently. And then eventually they get to a point where, oh, uh, what are the quotas of, of uh, Hispanics, females? and so whatever the the groups are so so w w you started out talking about diversity of thinking and somehow we ended up at quotas so either you're not that bright or you think I'm not that bright or you're just you just don't know enough to ask those questions so so in, th in those situations I kind of say look I'll cut you some slack. You're new. Uh, you're optimistic, and uh, you know we'll. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, does that resonate? I mean, it's a lot of yeah, that. I just, I just love the. You know, that's pretty much the onboarding system of a lot of companies. Listen, you're new. You're optimistic. Yeah, right, we're, that's it. Okay. <laughs> well, Get we'll beat work. you. We'll beat you down at some point, but for now, we're going to use that vigor. Um, so then I, I see kind of a forking in the in the road. So so the forking happens into two major groups. There's the believers, and then there are the you know I, I call them the skeptics uh, or maybe the realists is is a better term for it. But the believers are people who you know buy into the cultural message. They truly believe and 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 want to live it. And and those uh, break into three categories uh, themselves. So the believers end up with these alphas who love the corporate game they love you know either that corporation or what it affords them uh, in terms of you know self-worth in terms of money in terms of uh, whatever else that they find valuable and they just excel at everything and they end up running divisions or the company itself the next level down is the um, what I would call the uh, survivor so they're they're good they'll get to a middle management position but they know how to work the system and manipulate things so they get a promotion they get a bonus so they they know how to manipulate within the company and then there's the soldiers who may not have the the talent that the other two have but certainly you know buy into it and will mobilize people to do what needs to get done um, the other fork in the road, which is the realist, you know, you have the performers. So people are really good, but kind of have a good sense of humor about where things are going. And, you know, they don't buy into the rah-rah thing, but they're really smart, really capable. They do the job, but they may not necessarily make it to the top levels that the alphas would on the believer side. Uh, then you have sort of these heretics, which are the, you know, they could end up as, you know, they could leave the company and end up as the next Richard Branson. They could stay in the company and get beaten down, or they can uh, truly change the company in some cases, or they might end up quitting and working phone support somewhere just because they couldn't take corporate anymore. So there are these wild cards. And then there's the nine to fivers, which is a big population and they're kind of look I, I know what needs to get done to, to finish the job but ultimately my family is what matters or my uh, hobbies are what matters or my boats or my cars whatever that they enjoy doing they just want to get out at a decent hour and they don't want you to get in the way so if you ask them for a favor or to do something outside of their uh, you know their their time zone or comfort zone don't expect much so so that's kind of how I saw it and I, I'd love to get your your thoughts on that breakdown down. Uh, well, I think the reason that, that there'd even be that strata of, of engagement from cultures inside a company is that most companies misperceive intellectual engagement for emotional engagement. And it's the emotional engagement that's critical. So it, 
take a typical strategic rollout or some engagement survey where everybody we say, so here's our go-to-market strategy and here's our product set. What do you think? Everybody goes, that's great. That's great. I totally get that. I believe in that. That may be. All they're saying is it's a smart idea. All they're saying is it makes sense as a product set. For a culture to say we're actually going to do our part to make this successful, you move from intellectual engagement to emotional engagement. And I'm not talking about emotion as soft stuff. Only in business would we ever have to put that disclaimer. Like, you know, emotion? <laughs> come on. Wait, wait, no, 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 no. Come back. Come back. Right. <laughs> Emotion in the human brain is a highly rational process. It's capable of producing wonderfully irrational responses like love and support. But the opposite of emotional is not rational. The opposite of emotional is detached. And most uh, managers and employees in a culture operate uh, with, with a, a pretty high level of detachment. And it's not because they are born detached. It's because circumstances in the company have caused them to be detached. A culture is the most rational organism in the world. A, a culture, manager culture, employee culture, customer culture, a culture is agnostic, it's objective, it's an open system, uh, but uh, it's not, it, the, the difference between compliance and defiance from a culture, because a culture will give you whatever you want, it all rests in you knowing what the culture wants. And most companies, it is startlingly, a competence that most companies and the people manage them just simply don't have, no matter how smart they are at other things. How a culture works and how to work it is just a missing competency, and it's the key to everything. Yeah, I totally agree, and you know, I, I have a process called the four C's of innovation, and one of the C's is culture. So a lot of people think that you know, innovation is about coming <laughs> up with great products or services or ideas. That's a tiny fraction of it. The the major thing that'll make something succeed or fail is the culture of the organization and a lot of times that culture fights change with incredible ferocity so what have you found that might work to get those people who um, aren't built for change or basically are saying listen don't screw it up for me you know what, whatever you do just don't mess it up because I've got a good thing going well, so how do you address that well I there, there are probably some people, uh, the, the human beings uh, that become employees and become managers are fully formed human beings for better or worse by the time they join the enterprise. So if they've had, if they've been dropped on their head a lot as a little kid and learned to fear, you know, anything that says, we're going to pick you up, it's like, oh my God, then you may not be able to directly impact that. But, but the capacity to give to the enterprise what the enterprise wants is is latent in every manager and every employee culture. But the problem is that companies expect the employee culture to understand the business logic. It's not up to the employee culture to understand the business logic. It's up to the business to understand the employee culture's logic, how and why a culture works. So uh, a culture exists to protect itself. That's why it comes into being when, when, uh, uh, when a group of people share the same basic lifestyle, environment, circumstances, and living conditions, they band together to share the beliefs about how best to survive. So a culture is concerned about its survival and emotional prosperity, and that's why it exists to do this. So it's an information gathering organism designed to assure its own survival and emotional mm -hmm. prosperity. And that means neither business logic nor management authority nor competitive urgency will ever convince an employee culture to adopt the corporate cause as if it were its own. In that killing field between company concept and employee commitment lays many a failed strategic plan. You want the culture to buy it, you have to know how to sell it to them. And that's where uh, the mystery begins for, for most companies is, is how do you do that? And so there, there becomes this belief about the culture that manager and employee cultures are somehow genetically impaired. They couldn't give you the commitment and productivity and loyalty you want as the enterprise if their lives depend on it. That's not true. There, there's no natural limiter to a culture. A culture, again, will give you whatever you want. You just have to give it what it wants first. And so to understand that is, is the tricky part for a culture. When we're talking about managers and, and uh, employees and even customers as a culture, we're not talking about a bunch of managers, employees, and customers. When they form together as a culture, they are far more self-protective 
they are far more intelligent. They're far more resistant to standard methods of corporate influence. But you could say, I'm going to wrap this up and get your other questions. But you could say, well, listen, if a culture exists to protect itself and its concerns are, how do I survive in this environment? And, uh, and knowing I'm going to be okay, how do I get rewarded emotionally and avoid punishment? Okay, I'm going to speak very slowly to you employees now. Make the company successful. There's a good chance you're going to survive and we'll tell you you're doing a great job. Well, that logic only works if there's a dependable through line in the culture's perceptions that what's good for the company is good for them. And chances are that there's dirt in that machine and the culture's got all its own logic and all its own perceptions that are very well founded to say that's not true. And as long as that's not true, you're just off. And you, you get to get to something like change. Management is always frustrated about the seeming reluctance of an employee culture to embrace change. How many senior management meetings have you been in? A bunch of the C suite sitting around and saying, Well, we don't have a problem with change. Must be why we're senior management. Well, let's face it, Steve, change is a whole lot easier to deal with if you invented the damn change yourself. And if it's not going to happen until you're ready for it to happen. And if when it does happen, you have a bunch of resources to throw at that change to make it happen. Change to an employee culture, even good change, represents a strike at the heart of what the culture is all about. A culture exists to protect the known rules of survival and emotional prosperity. Any change screws with the known rules of survival and emotional prosperity. So it's not that the culture hates change, it hates the loss that change represents, the loss of the known. So my long-winded way of answering your question specifically, if you want to do one thing as management, one thing to help calm the culture's concerns about change, it's, and, and this is going to sound very simple, but in, in the constant drive to be bigger, faster, better, more, 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 it's something the enterprise just doesn't do. In the middle of explaining what is changing to your people, you must also take the time to explain what isn't changing. Mm. So, yes, this is new, this is new, this is different, this is different. But here's who we still are. Here's who we have always been. Here's who we will always be. But that's once change has already been decided upon. What, what I'm talking about is a little bit before that, which is, you know, how do you initiate that change? So, so you know, just to get very uh, tactical, you know, you've got, um, in some cases, groups that are doing new things. They're fighting for resources. Those new things aren't necessarily proven. <coughs> They're in meetings where they have to defend their little business with, you know, against people who have budgets that are bigger than the revenues of their business. So you have this, uh, you know, dichotomy where you've got super empowered people within the organization and then and they've got resources and, and historical inertia and then you've got the upstarts which you know have to convince management which is often risk averse that these things are worth trying or doing so in that convincing process what do you think works and what doesn't work what are the tools or tactics you can take to to help that along I think I think you have to make uh the business case as well as the emotional case for anything you're asking. Mm -hmm. There has to be some sense of self you take from our ability to innovate and uh, our ability to be uh, competitively agile and and all the things that go into that. That's the emotional case and and then you have to put it in metrics that the, the company already engages in observing. Managers, employees, let's just take a manager culture as an example. Managers have, have a gun to their head all the time. Perform, perform, perform. It's developed a, a feral survival sense. They may not be doing what they think they should be doing, what's best for the company to do, what they want to be doing. They are damn well doing what they think is going to get the gun away from their head the fastest. So even if you make, a, a, if you say in order to innovate, people really need to bring that emotional engagement to work, and that's got to be a safe and reasonable proposition to people, and then they've got to be given the tools. But this latent ability to, to explore and to innovate is, is in everybody. We just have to let it loose. That's just not going to happen unless that gun is away from their head. So, so it's, it's really making innovation a feasible prospect. But I, I, I would say that you don't want the entire organization to be bent on innovation. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, somebody's actually got to get the stuff done at some <laughs> point. That's like yeah. saying when we we have companies that all the time that say, you know, we need our cultures to be more accountable. Can you fix that? And we say by accountable, would you? And then they say we want them to be entrepreneurial. Okay, listen, sport. All right. First of all, entrepreneurs do entrepreneurial things. They don't yeah. work in multi-billion. That's right. Company. That's right. They have to fill out form fifty-one Z to get a budget. <laughs> and, and entrepreneurs, are you sure you want entrepreneurs? Because yeah. entrepreneurs are people that will take sticks, twigs, and mud, and just with the power of their own drive and vision, build it into an empire single-handedly. And then, because they're bored, they will single-handedly take that empire and reduce it to twigs and, and mud. <clears throat> That's like saying, you know, we live in a log cabin. We need a pet. Why don't we get a couple of termites? You know, just a couple for breeding stock. You know, it's like <laughs> you don't want entrepreneurs. That's yeah. the last thing you want. You want people to act like entrepreneurs, maybe show that kind of initiative. But they don't all have to innovate. They just have to take their part of the innovation, I believe. Yeah. And help move it down the road. Yeah, and there's innovation roles within uh, the spectrum. So not everyone has to be the visionary. Not everyone has to be this, you know, hard charging, you know, stepping on toes kind of person. Uh, I think you need a combination. You need the analytical thinker to evaluate it. You need the, you know, the operator to get it through the corporate machine. You need people who don't mind filling out yeah. the form 15Z. Um, but you know, it's not it's not a straightforward one man. You know, entrepreneurs are a different breed. And you know, I actually have have explained what you just did in in a slightly different way to people, where I said, you know, when you're dealing with a corporation, you're dealing with a population that has self selected into security. So they're people who you know who made that choice for a reason. They they didn't choose to go start their own company. They chose to work their way through an organization. They like the protection. They like the safety. Maybe they like the camaraderie. Maybe they like the 401k. Whatever it is that they like, they've chosen a very different path, a structured one, to uh, compared to an unstructured one. So already you're starting out with a cultural, um, you know, uh, deficiency uh, just walking into the room. That's true, uh, but I still believe that that potential for innovation can be tapped as needed yeah. by the enterprise. In some cases, the enterprise, there, there are very few companies that actually base their entire value proposition and relevance uh, around constant innovation. That is a mm -hmm. bruising company. To, that's, it's exhausting to try for Apple to always try and be Apple. And that would be the same thing as, as a Walmart and their distribution system and, and a control of margins. Not every company can do that. Yeah. But, but there are all kinds of ways to, you can innovate around cost control and, and, and expense reduction in a company. You can inter, innovate around a lot of non-sexy things. The key still is whether the employee culture, and I'm talking manager and employees, even though they're separate cultures, is if they have that emotional engagement and they want to protect the company. I, I, listen, I don't know any way of saying this without it sounding like like an ad. Okay, I just my first book. Oh God! Ring a bell next time you do that or something. That's right. Anyway, it's it's all about how to get emotional commitment from a manager culture. Yeah. And and one of the things I say in there is 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 the new truth for this is that company cannot always be the first cause. Manager's ability to practice true fulfillment within the company also has to be a cause. That's not licensing chaos, that's ensuring control. There's no better way for the company to become the cause than by not always insisting on being the cause. And companies, because they're not really tapping cultural commitment, so they don't really get the dependable innovation, they have to ask for it. They have to bribe it. They have to bully you. They have to push you. They have to insist on it. They have to give you t-shirts that say innovation on it. And because the the corporate organism is insecure constantly because it's not naturally getting that kind of commitment, then uh, then all of these things that should be natural in, in an enterprise where people care about the success of the enterprise or they're part of the enterprise have to be forced. They have to be presented as intellectual arguments. That's like, have you ever tried to convince somebody of all the reasons that they should love you? Listen, we're perfect together. I hate <laughs> asparagus. You hate asparagus, okay? <laughs> We're per it doesn't work, okay? No. It's, it's got to be an, an emotional and missing the need to fix that once and for all, although you also have to maintain it, is what causes not everybody to bring their innovation game to the enterprise.
And, and even the term innovation is is a bit overplayed, and in some ways, I think. Um, irrelevant you know it, it may be at a time at some time was a good thing to rally the troops but now I feel like you know the if you're really in it uh, and you're really innovating you're probably not talking about it you're probably doing it and it's it's like people and sex right people who are always talking about sex <laughs> probably right. aren't yeah. doing it that much right. um, yeah. and and I think that um, with with innovation you know at least the way I approached it to me it's about defensible growth and, you know those are not sexy words but I want something I, it doesn't have to be innovative I just want to know that it's gonna grow and if I put it out into the marketplace, I can uh, offer something that others can't for an extended period of time. So to me, that's how I view innovations in a mo much more tangible but less sexy way. Well, I, I agree with you. I think it, if we're talking at an enterprise level, innovation isn't an idea. Innovation is a process. It's a machine. It's a company-wide commitment. The idea may be very sexy, and that's what goes directly to the customer in the world. But what had to back that up and how tightly the company had to be controlled in some cases, including innovating new ways to do that, to, to, to manage the supply chain, to, to do all the kinds of things that make innovation a feasible process, that's where the sex is there. I mean, it's not in the, you know, here we go with a, with a groovy new ad campaign. That, that's not it. Yeah. And, and uh so that, that may be part of the problem, too, is that, that the credit is not given to people who enable innovation to happen in an enterprise. It's the grunt work, and it, it's not sexy, and it's not exciting uh, to, to people who are just tilted toward innovation. It's very exciting if you love that sort of thing. I mean, it's a fetish all by itself, you know? Uh, <laughs> Uh, there are special outfits if you are just like a control freak, you know, elastic you know? ones or, or elastic ones and yeah. sometimes they're built not to give. That, listen, I don't, we don't probably don't have time for that. But no, no. But it's uh, it, it's uh, it's that recognizing that that the actual idea may be the end product of a lot of innovation in very small but significant ways throughout the enterprise. And I think maybe that's part of the problem. Is those people don't get the glory. They're kind of considered, you know, the, the lower levels and then the people with the big ideas. Those big ideas would never get developed if it wasn't for people who knew how to work the dark room. Yeah, and, you know, one thing that I always made a point of doing is uh, giving credit to people who uh, played some sort of role in whatever new process we, we implemented, you know, whether it's, you know, the technical people that help do the, you know, technology audit so we can sign the partnership deal with the external provider. Like, it, it, you know, uh, uh, credit is divisible. You know, so you can share it with uh, an infinite number of people. And I think that's something that definitely helps uh, people who are typically so deep in the trenches they never see the light. Uh, and it, it helps them, you know, get up the next day and, and keep doing and doing more for you than they would for the other guy who's also asking them for the same kind of thing. I think you're right. I think I think that the person who suggested the, who came up with the innovative idea in the first place, once they've done that, they're probably the least significant person in the entire process. Mm. I mean, yeah. Their only significance would be to course correct it if it's, if it's going uh, in a direction they didn't intend. But at that point, they're handing it off. And the rest of the team that never gets the credit for innovation is driving it over the line. So, so you know, there, there are some organizations that are at their core innovative. And, you know, whether it's, it's a cultural point of origin, like in Google, you know, where they just are, are constantly throwing stuff out there. Look at the platform we're using right now. Uh, they're uh, always innovating. Um, but, you know, it's also much easier to innovate in digital. It's much harder when you have to ship things and build mm -hmm. huge factories. So, so those are much bigger capital decisions. You can't just slap a beta sticker on it and throw it out there. Right, right. So, um, you know, what I find, though, for those legacy type businesses that didn't grow up with innovation, um, my observation has been that um, the thing that makes them change is uh, necessity. And that usually means, you know, uh, uh, some sort of near bankruptcy, some kind of near failure of a division, some major catastrophic event. 
opportunistic innovation is something they're okay saying no to. And I think part of it is human psychology. Part of it is that self-selection we talked about. But how do you overcome that? How do you get the opportunistic, um, trigger those opportunistic uh, senses uh, to get the same reaction that, uh, that the horror of failure of a company would create? So it's very hard to put those two on par. And oftentimes people say, you know, it's sort of like losing uh, a million dollars, excuse me, um, uh, winning a million dollars or losing $10,000. So if someone said, look, you have a 50-50 chance of making a million dollars, but you have to put up $10,000 to do it. Most people are so risk averse, they'd rather not put up the money because they're just not wired that way. Risk is a much bigger component of their psyche than, than reward. So how do you address that and what are the triggers you could use? Well, if you're, if you're saying that essentially... Uh the cultures have to decide that it would be a bigger risk not to do this. Then I, I wouldn't make it. Yes, it, it's true. If the cult, if the company is fighting for its survival, you may walk into your radio station and find that yesterday we played punk rock. Now we're new Christian modern. You know, <laughs> it's whatever we got to be. That's right. it, it, it's but but that's that's very undependable energy in a company to say that. If, if all we're going to do is innovate in reaction to a competitive threat, and there's just so many things wrong with that, including the competition really doesn't control what's most important in your own business. You're your own competition. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that you begin to demonize your competition if, you're, if, if the whole focus of the business is to beat another company at their game. You end up on their game, not on your own game. Yeah. But, uh, so under the heading, once again, of not soft stuff, uh, this is a, the, there's a couple of issues here. First of all, you, you have to make it a company worth protecting and worth growing. So there has to be some legitimate noble purpose attached to the business. Why is this business important? And why the better and the bigger and the more we do of it, the bigger, better and bigger it is uh, uh, for the world uh, or our world, the world that we serve. There has to be something there. It doesn't have to be altruistic. It just has to be a sense of what we do and how we do it and why we do it actually matters. And that's something that once a culture buys off on that and takes some sense of self from that, any change that comes in from the outside, any requirement to innovate, it's a matter of protecting what's important to them, not defending against an attack on what's important to them. So I would say that's first. And second, you just have to make it safe for the culture to do this. Yeah. Thing. So we're, we're back on, on air now. Yeah. The amazing thing about technology is that, you know, one of the reasons I think that um, young people now have this disproportionate power uh, in corporations is that they have this uh, edge in understanding the technology, or at least it's a perception by the older people that they that they know something that they don't, so they're afraid. So they're like, oh yeah, intern, come to our board meeting and present to the CEO about Twitter. And right. meanwhile, the intern doesn't know anything. They're, they're, right. gr they're as green as as interns have ever been but you know that little bit of fear gives them some leverage don't you think i do i do i keep saying around here i can't wait till my son turns five so we can fire tech support <laughs> Well, you know, but that's the thing, you, you know, we, we, I think it's a temporary thing where people are buying into it in the short term. They're, they're saying, hey, you know, uh, this, this young kid, you know, he's on every social platform. He's constantly tweeting on Facebook. He must know something. And we're trying to be social because, you know, we're uh, a tire company. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we need a social media presence. <laughs> um so we, where were we? Okay. Well, you know, you just kind of encapsulated the question. How does a company that's a tire company end up innovating? You know? yeah, well, well, you know, it, it, it's a, a slightly nuanced version of that question, which is how does that tire company attract those same young uh, uh, ingenues or, or, or the, the, uh, the young intelligentsia that would otherwise go to Google or Facebook or whoever? So anyway, when I was asked that question, my answer was, well, you know, and I don't know how many times you've heard this since we've had technological issues, but <laughs> bear with me. Um, my answer was that 
you know, when you have a, uh, when you're a guy and you're dating, women are attracted to a guy who has some kind of purpose in life. Whatever that might be, he doesn't have to be rich, but at least he has to look and seem like he's got something going on. And and so um, I think the same thing goes for companies. Companies, if they uh, have a vision, they communicate that vision clearly, and um, that has a natural attractive power uh, for others, and I think youth as well. So I think y you'll naturally find a reason for them to be the clearer your vision uh, might be. Now, I, I think that's only part of the answer. There's probably uh, other components that, that, you know, that go along here, and then there's some that will never attract those, those people that will go to Google. So, so maybe they they're write-offs in this in this scenario. But I'm just curious what some of those other elements might be in your mind. Well, I I think that, that first of all, I think it's it's mythology that companies buy into that just because you're young, you must be free thinking and creative, and it's the same thing you're talking about, and, and understand how social media works. Uh, you're just young, okay, and that, that, that doesn't doesn't mean anything. Uh, and by the same token, but at the same time, you're an older company, a staid company, at least from appearances, that you can't innovate unless you import innovation. It's just not true. It's it's yeah. the it's a bias toward innovation. It's it's the stuff we've been talking about. It's getting people in the company to believe that this company has to be successful, not just to enrich already bloated senior managers and mythical shareholders. It has to be successful because what this company does is important. Even if it's a very narrow segment to a very specific audience, what it does is important. More important than that is how we do it is important. So as a culture, if I'm putting my good name on this company's intention and representing it to other human beings with my own good name, well, that's okay because quality is protected here by absolute psychotics who never sleep. Even if you're just making a widget, it doesn't matter that there's a lunatic fringe in the company about what we do, and we're so taken with it, we believe the rest of the world should be too. It's important, and, and more important than anything, it's why this company exists. If, if this company does, as we were talking about, have some built-in noble purpose about the way we're going to treat people in the company, the way we're going to treat the communities that we do business from, the way we're going to, we're going to treat the world and world events, we're not only going to be relevant to our customers when we want to sell them something, because that means we're choosing to be irrelevant to them for the rest of the time. We're going to be relevant to their real world and, and, and empathetic and you can build the kinds of things that cause people to be on the hunt for new and better ways to do things. And I think it's, it's almost commoditizing innovation to say, yeah, give me like a, give me a 16 year old. In fact, give me two 16 year, okay, I tell you what, <laughs> give me one 23 year old hot, okay, and then three or four of these scraggly 16 year olds, okay, we're going to innovate, baby. You know, I, it's just, it just doesn't work. And, and, not to mention that not every company can even withstand the impact of innovation, nor is it always justified, at least in typical senses. There's plenty of non-sexy ways to innovate. So I think that, that your dating analogy is, is, uh, is and we're going to both get shot for this. Uh, it's okay. All right, all right to the hell with it, right? Yeah. And the dating analogy is it's, it's charisma that they're attracted to, and the charisma is confidence, is, is uh, is some sense of self is, is I mean when when you meet somebody who's charismatic whether they're an iconic leader or just somebody in a bar uh, it's it's that they have they have confidence without being arrogant and they have some humility but uh, still the right kind of energy to do something you can build those you bake that into any culture in the world it doesn't matter whether by business alone they're doing something as as bent toward innovation as Google has to be. Mm -hmm. You can innovate, you can protect, you can say this far, no further with the way we're doing things. But in order to do that, you have to have people in the company care enough about the company to explore new and better ways of doing it. That's not age related. That's, that's a cultural issue and that's affected by all the things that affect the culture. So, so how in, in that model, how important are two things? One is a worldview 
and two is a do-gooder component. You know, so a worldview to me is, you know, <laughs> everyone in the company has to understand that if X happens, this is our position. So that's how you know the cultural values are communicated effectively all throughout the organization and maybe, you know, hopefully to the outside world as well. So if X happens, this will be our stance because that is who we represent or what we represent as a company. The second component of it, that thing, does it have to be good? Uh, or does it have to be perceived as good by both the employees and the outside world? I think it does have to be perceived as good. It doesn't have to be perceived as great. You don't have to be a world shaker. Right? You don't have to be an Apple. You don't have to be a Google. You don't have to be any of those companies. But it's, yeah, it's got to be perceived as good. What you're talking about are, are it, I think it's probably the most essential understanding of how to work with a culture to get innovative behavior, any desired behavior out of them. It's understanding that a culture is a human organism. And like any organism, particularly a human organism, its first priority is to survive. Mm -hmm. In order to survive, any human organism needs energy. But they need energy to, to defend and, and feed itself and, and procreate, to go back mm -hmm. to your dating analogy. Uh, but uh, a culture has an extraordinary need for energy because a culture's entire business is trying to figure out the rules of survival in a world that they cannot reliably control or easily predict. So their entire business is to take any incoming information, any perception, any memo, any speech, any we do this, we don't do this, anything and crunch it to extract reliable meaning that they can apply to their survival, to its survival. And if those things are unclear in any way or conflicting, they also have to use energy to keep up defense shields against the unknown and hunker down and move in small steps. So the things that will move a culture toward innovation are giving it back that energy. I'm not talking energy in some woo-woo sense. I'm talking about lifeblood for a culture. And there are three dimensions that I would say uh, control a culture's energy. The first is context. Can the culture understand why something is happening in the company? So if it is linked to a noble purpose that just never changes, this is why we do what we do in this company. Okay, then I don't have to expend as much energy trying to figure out how to survive here. Because I know why things happen here. Yeah. Second is predictability. Can the culture predict, if you gave it five, ten, a hundred scenarios, here's something that happened. How will, the, how will this company respond based upon what it says is important to it? So then I don't have to worry about the rules of survival. And the third is sense of self. Can I take a positive sense of self from what this company does, but more important, how it does it and why it does it? And if, those, if the energy is high in context, predictability, and self, you have a culture that's charged up and ready to go. And you could, you could take Apple as an example, which is notoriously a tough culture. They don't always pay the best. They're secretive. They're cult-like. They're just flat-out annoying about a lot of things to work there. We've had people that are in very senior posi positions work for me in my company from Apple, and they're just notoriously a, a tough culture. Not a bad culture, a tough one. But there's no question if you work for Apple why the company is doing what it's doing. No question the stand that it will take. We do this, we don't do this, predictability. And you could be socially severely limited and just say, yeah, I work for Apple. You'll be immediately surrounded by single fonts at the airport on a, in a party. So the culture will trade off a lot to get that. The stuff that you're talking about, no, the, the, the company doesn't have to do great Google change the world kinds of things. It really doesn't. It has to be a good company where only special people can, can work. And if the culture believes that and, and has the rest of the energy, the culture will naturally innovate. It'll go wherever you point it. So to come from where you just were, full circle to, you know, the premise that I laid out a little bit earlier, you know, there are different types of people within an organization, right? So that same message will be received very differently by each of those types. So you've got the super committed alphas that are setting that tone. Then you've got the soldiers that are following them. <laughs> but then on the other side, you might have more skeptical people. You might have ones that are, some might be nine to fivers. Others, you know, perceive that there's a lot of 
you know problems in the organizations or, 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 or changes that need to be made or you might have others that are just naturally skeptical but really smart and capable but but sure. they won't buy into the rah rah you know programming that people want to send out so do you purge the non-soldiers or do you uh, change the message or the delivery mechanism so that those others that aren't prone to to the programming to accepting the programming can still uh, you know, absorb and function uh, under that that message. I think it's more toward the the, the, the latter option. You recognize that, that that a culture couldn't survive if everybody was innovative. It would be total chaos, and nothing would get mm -hmm. done. And again, it's not that the company even needs that necessarily. Yeah. Uh, but it's it it all goes back to an understanding of the culture. If the culture is cynical. Cynical and, and isn't moving because it's just going to give you a cynical response to anything. Cynical doesn't mean the culture doesn't care. Apathy would mean it doesn't care. Cynical means it hurts to care. The culture has still got plenty of commitment to give to, to any business improvement if it's convinced it's safe and sane to give it. So somewhere along the line, again, there's dirt in that pipe that is causing the culture to say, for everything we perceived and analyzed and understand to be true, there's that's not a safe thing to do to innovate here we could step out on the plank we could we could you know we're already initiative weary and wary we've been sold stuff before when it comes to the whiners in a culture rather than get rid of them you got to actually celebrate them because people whine because they care about something and it's in trouble and they can't fix it and they can't stop caring about it so in a lot of times the whiners are the ones that bought off on the original promise of the company and they see it being diluted and disrespected. And they, I mean, those are those are key indicator parts of the culture for you. So I think you bring a, you bring a culture along as it, you sell to the early adopters right, in a culture. You turn them into cultural disciples and the culture begins to sell it to itself, which has got more impact than the company can, can have by selling from outside the culture. And the culture brings the, the, the laggards along with it. And in a really healthy culture, the culture will get rid of the people who don't buy in for you. You don't even have to do it. Yeah. I, and that's the ultimate success. And that, that's a company who's not sporadically innovative, but dependably innovative. Yeah, in, in, in my own efforts, what I've always tried to do is make both the lessons from failure as well as the successes visible and reward all the people that contributed in both situations uh, equally because I think you have to set that tone that you won't will not be punished if something goes wrong so and and you have to do it over time but but you only have so much time because at some point you do need successes under your belt to make the whole thing work you know you so do. so you know you can only share so many failures before they go well isn't it great that they're rewarding bob for trying but you know yeah. how many how many times can bob try and fail that's right that's right you can you need that culture of accountability uh, now, we dealt in the last three or four years when companies really hit the wall unexpectedly, companies had been on some growth arc and then 2008, 2009 hit the wall. Uh, we found that, that cultures were primed for uh, to be a, a culture of non-accountability. And there's a few things we said to companies in cases like that. Uh, first of all, you should only accept one equation of accountability. All your complicated rationale, I remember when Stuart Parnell was CEO of uh, the peanut company, Peanut Corporation of America. It's a couple years ago when their plants were so filthy that, that rat pieces were falling in the chunky peanut butter and they were sickening and then killing customers, horrifying their wholesale customers. Consumers were fleeing in droves. And, uh, and the, the uh, FDA said, listen, you got to clean this up. And they didn't clean it up. And they went back and looked at the plants again. They said, all right, you know what? You're out of business. We're shutting the plants down. So Stuart Parnell's statement to the press was, repeated plant closings have forced us into bankruptcy. What? <laughs> no, actually, rot dro rat droppings that cause projectile vomiting that horrified your customers that sicken and kill your consumers. That actually was responsible. The only equation of accountability that, that any senior manager should accept is, this is what we did or didn't do equals this is what happened. And what we said to companies in those tough times is, listen, there's two things that we know about these tough times. Number one, they're not going to last forever. Number two, the story of how you stood up to them will. 
you're going to be living with that story for a long time. It's time you start writing it so it ends the way you want it to. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, again, it's that understanding that, yeah, we'll accept Bob's failure. You know, to a point, Bob, Bob, you know, uh, but it's, it's that, that we won't, that we won't allow outside circumstances to dictate internal performance. But we're going to tilt up against the entire world economy and say it's that besides the sales team, you know this, Steve, when things are bad, it's the economy. When things are good, it's our own tireless expertise and boundless of wisdom. Of course. Okay, you're right. And so our message to all those companies is, listen, whining is not a strategy. Victim is not a job description. Everybody else is in trouble, too, is not management information. If you keep a culture with a – they're not intimidated by failure. But the the company moves to suck out the learning experiences there, and 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 look at the uh, distinguish the approach from the the outcome. Then yeah, you're going to build a company of innovation. It gets back to what we were talking about: is it safe in the culture's perception to do this? And the culture's credibility detector is infallible. It, it, it's its perceptions are alarmingly accurate, and it, its memory is elephantine. You cannot bluff, bribe, or bully. A culture. The culture is going to look at how you really treat these issues of innovation. Do you only give credit to the person with the idea? Do you, do you squash it? Is it so dangerous to step outside your comfort zone? Are, are companies so dug in and defended that you can't cross lines in business units to say, this is not really my team, an idea. That kind of stuff, if that's protected, you'll get innovation. And the, again, the culture will go to work on anybody who's slow to come along. I've personally witnessed this huge gap between what is said and what the reality is because you see who's getting promoted and then you see who uh, is getting, you know, uh, what is getting a lot of, uh, uh, you know, airtime and the two are very different. So right. you can talk a lot about change. You can talk a lot about innovation. You can talk about, you know, all these great things you've done. But if you look at what's being rewarded, sometimes the two don't match. So I think that sends a much more powerful powerful message yes. to the company than anything you 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 write a internal blog post about that's right two things to know about a culture a culture deals in the real and all truths are self-centered so it, it it doesn't mean that the culture won't give you what you want again you just have to give it what it wants first and understanding what it really wants that it's that you can't you can't bluff it or bribe it or bully it into any dependable performance. It will look at the things you're talking about. It'll look at did this said this, and if it's, there's a gap there, you got to close it, and then the culture will give you what you want. So uh, let's talk about the the heretic for a second. You know, the, this is the person that takes you know a job of change in a company. They're tasked with you know, launching a new product uh, or heading a new division or uh, managing innovation or whatever that, that change role is, uh, whether they come from inside the company or from outside. Um, what is your advice to that person? Uh, do, 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 they, <laughs> do they have hope or should they uh, stop trying and go on to the outside in most cases? What are the are there steps they can take, or are there steps out that they should uh, take? Because <laughs> <laughs> because you know they, they, maybe they're living a lie from the very beginning. Yeah, they're living the dream. Yeah, it's just a dream, right? Uh, I, I would say first of all to that person, number one, don't flatter yourself. Okay, it takes a lot of people to make it to allow innovation. Mm -hmm. Number two, make sure that, that the company has got the true tolerance for it. A lot of innovations, the, the, the ones that become iconic are driven by some individual vision of the future and the ability to, uh, to, to bring different perspectives and merge them to create some new, uh, new reality. But, but most innovations in companies happen by accident. Mm -hmm. And so if the company does not have a tolerance, if they don't have an accident lab, and they don't have the patience for that. And they're not confident because most companies are fundamentally insecure and they're being pushed to grow too fast. And so uh, they're frightened and defensive. And uh, that's not the kind of place where you're legitimately going to be able to innovate. If you're being asked to innovate around a, a single problem, I would say that would be a big warning sign. Because usually, if that's the case, that you need to innovate around something, then something systemic isn't working and the problem didn't, didn't fix itself. Um, 
So I, I would say you really have to check the capacity of the organization to deal with it and your ability to build a team in places that seem inconsequential but are actually critical uh, to be able to do that. And then I, I think you have to go in at that per, uh, that person is not just writing in on the glory of the idea. It's got to be sustainable to be real to the enterprise. It has to be manageable and affordable. So you do need to make the business case as well as the emotional case. And if you miss one or the other, and the final thing I would say is, like we started talking about, don't assume because you get intellectual engagement, you have emotional engagement. So if, if you create this, this great idea and roll it out and people go, now that's a great idea. <sighs> Crickets. Nobody is moving. You know, that, that's wake me when we get there, Chief. You have got to be able to make the business case as well. You've got to get that gun away from the culture's head. So they say, with the limited energy we have, since it's being uh, asked, uh, sought for so many things, we feel that by helping you with this innovation, we actually are uh, helping do what we're supposed to do for the business. Yeah, and, and I, I, I do want to emphasize something really important that you said earlier, which is um, – the importance of that upfront diagnosis, you know, really having a true sense of are you being tasked to solve the right problem and are you coming in, coming into it at the right level and at the right level of support because there could be something so structurally wrong that, that you're being asked the wrong question. You know, this happened, um, you know, I, I was uh, uh, consulting to a company years ago. Uh, they brought us in. They were uh, basically a call center and uh, testing company. So they, uh, they were an outsourced uh, call center for banks and for gaming. And they brought us in to um, to choose a new technology to run their platform. And it, did, it took me about a week of, of meeting with their executives and, and talking to people to figure out that that wasn't even remotely their problem. Right. Their problem was they, they didn't know what business they were in. You know, they needed to clarify their vision. They need, needed to divest a piece of their business that was causing them to lose focus. They had pricing issues. So, so all the things that we were asked to do or the one thing we were asked to do had very little to do with their imminent success or failure. So, and I think a lot of that happens in innovation too, where they're like, oh, we need to be in this space, so let's figure out how to be in, do you, is that the problem? And, and I think that diagnosis is very uh, underappreciated, uh, but is critically important. I mean, you could, you could look at, at the poster child for this, you could look at an Apple as an example and say, did innovation really make Apple as successful as it was? If that was the case, why did Steve end up ceding control of the company to Tim Cook, who's not that innovative of a guy? Or was it the supply chain? Mm -hmm. Was it the operating discipline? Was it the quality discipline? Those are the kinds of things that really enabled that company to execute and control costs. And that. There, there's, a, there's a number of things that go into that. I, I think you're right. Most companies are treating the symptom, not the sickness. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, on that note, <laughs> uh, we, we've certainly given a flavor for some prescriptions, but uh, I'd love people to provide feedback. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, put this up as an audio podcast, um, and it's going to accompany the uh, blog post that I put up uh, on Forbes. And what I'll try to do is uh, edit down some highlights from this video and post them up as well on, uh, in, com Great. in companionship with the article. Excellent. Awesome. Awesome. It's great, great to meet you. Where are you based? I'm in New York City. Where are you? Okay, uh, San Francisco. How how are things? Uh, you know, it's funny because okay, it's not funny, but it's it's crazy how when I arrived, I was actually in Spain for for work. And um, my flight was delayed. I was supposed to fly in on Tuesday. It was bumped to Thursday. Uh, when I arrived, my building, which is in Midtown, is fine. But then you walk to 39th Street. Everything south of 39th was yeah. still dark. Um, now um, it seems like it's pretty much back to normal. Occasionally there's a down tree or something like that. But Manhattan seems okay, uh, at least the, the mi middle part of it. Um, what happened in parts of Brooklyn, like where my parents live, they completely got... Um, you know, uh, wiped out. I mean, the, the, their electricity is out still. Uh, it might be out for another two weeks. Their whole generator blew up. And their cars totaled because it got uh, flooded completely with the um, salt water. So 
you know, there's really not much salvaging there. Um, and everyone, and, and there's looting going on in that building because now they know that people are not there. Uh, so the sooner they put the electricity up, the sooner people could come back. So it's, it's, it's a problem. And, you know, I, I think there are uh, some rich areas that got hit and they'll, probably be okay uh there's some poor areas that got hit and you know people are uninsured and that's going to be a problem so um yeah it's it's a mess it's a yeah mess. yeah i feel for you out there um yeah amazing yeah i mean do you have an answer for that is, is that book number four yeah that's book number four <laughs> yeah yeah that's it so uh, my message just hold on i'm writing yeah. as fast as i can all right all right yeah. stan it's a pleasure to meet you hopefully we can uh meet up in person some point soon yeah i'm sure i'm in new york all the time so uh, okay yeah let me know ping me yeah. and uh, we'll meet up yeah great 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 a pleasure care, yeah okay. talk to you later. okay bye-bye